The wine industry in the United States provides a good example. In recent years, the demand for wine in the USA has increased strongly, with consumption up by over a third. I've been in uh, the retail wine game for about 12 years. Uh, we've got about 7,200 different uh, wine selections to choose from. Can you give us a sense of what's been happening to the trend in wine consumption over the past, say, 20 years, in, in the American market at least? Well, wine sales have been steadily increasing. You know, I, I read maybe a couple months ago that wine had, had surpassed beer as being the most popular alcoholic beverage in the United States. Um, definitely uh, younger demographics are starting to become involved in uh, wine and becoming more interested in wine. Um, it's, uh, it's been seen to be more popular um, as a, an item to have with dinner, not just as a, as a uh, celebratory or a luxury item, but something to have at the table every night. Um, and popularity, is, popularity has steadily been increasing. Um, since about 94. I think as people are getting more educated, as they're having more wine with food, either at restaurant or at home, um, I can see that the trend will be continuing to rise. The Two Rivers Winery in Western Colorado is a small business established by Bob Whitman, an entrepreneur who recognized an opportunity for profits. So this is our winery. Well, this is our fermentation room, and it is uh, actually where we make wine. And this is all state-of-the-art fermentation. In 1999, when the Whitman started Two Rivers Winery, demand for wine was increasing. Prices were rising, creating opportunities for short-run profits. But Two Rivers wasn't alone in pursuing these profits. Other small wineries proliferated, and the large Californian winemakers increased their production. As supply increased, in the longer run prices retreated and firms responded in different ways. Some reduced prices and profits while others left the industry entirely. And I just have to say to you that a larger winery or a larger business reacts very slow and we react very quickly to opportunity. Typically a large organization that has the economy of scale that you're talking about, they'll have inventory build up and then they'll all get comfortable that they can sell their product for less than what they were selling it for previously because they have an inventory buildup. I would never do something like that. What I would do is I would react to my market in some fashion. I wouldn't lower my prices. So we're, we're more focused on uh, revenue enhancements as opposed to cutting expenses or reacting negatively to environmental changes. And they happen all the time. So short-run profits are an essential ingredient in an efficiently working market system. When consumers want more of a product, how do they see to it that they get what they want? Demand for the product rises, and as a result, prices rise. When prices rise, it encourages producers to produce more of that good. So more resources are allocated into the production of that industry, and those firms make profits. The profits attract new producers into the market so more resources are allocated into the market where consumers want them. So consumers wish to have more resources allocated to a market. How do they get what they want? They get it through the allocation of short-run profits. Profits in the short run are an essential part of the market mechanism. Now we're in a position to see that where perfect competition prevails, the market system is so powerful in dealing with the scarcity problem. First of all, notice that resources, society's scarce resources, go where consumers most want them. When demand rises, consumers are saying, we wish for more of this particular good. What's the process by which they actually get the extra goods that they wish for? When demand rises, price rises. When price rises, existing firms in the industry make short-run profits. Those short-run profits draw new producers into the market 
and output increases further in the long run. So we started off with consumers wanting more of a good and profits and the market system enabled them to get what they wanted. So profit is a value in guiding resources into markets where consumers most want resources to be. Short run profits are crucial because they draw resources in the long run. And long run profit is important because the only long run profit is the normal profit, the opportunity cost to the producer. And that is essential to keep him willing to supply those goods. But more than that, where perfect competition prevails, consumers are not exploited in any way. The price reflects in long run equilibrium the opportunity cost of the resources used in its production. So when you want to have a good, you would expect to have to pay for that good. What are you paying? You are paying for the opportunity cost of the resources. You are bidding the resource away from alternative uses. But you're not paying any more. The price you pay simply reflects the opportunity costs of all the resources that are used in production. And then finally we're now in a position to see that not only do resources follow consumer demand, but resources are used in an optimal way. Look at the diagram where we have one producer and we've just drawn here his marginal cost curve for the long run and the demand curve faced by that individual producer, the horizontal demand curve where price is equal to average revenue is equal to marginal revenue. How much output does the firm wish to produce? It wishes to produce where marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue. That's its best profit maximizing level of output. The firm is not producing that to maximize consumer welfare. It's producing that output to maximize its own private welfare. But now let's ask, what would it produce if it were interested in maximizing society's welfare? And the answer is the same level of output. The demand curve reflects the value that we place upon output. The demand curve is there because we think it's worth that much to us. The marginal cost curve reflects the amount of resources being used up to produce each unit of output. Why is marginal cost what it is? What is the firm spending? It's spending this money on land, labour, capital, scarce resources. So that marginal cost to the firm is marginal cost to society. It shows you the amount of resources being used up in producing any good, resources which are now not available to produce something else. The marginal cost curve represents the opportunity cost to society of the scarce resources being used. So what's best for society? What's best is that we produce all of the units of output where we value it at at least its opportunity cost of production, at at least what we could have had if the resources had been used somewhere else. At what point is that? It's where marginal cost, marginal resource usage, equals price, the value we place on the output. So what is the private optimum for the firm is where marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue. What is best for society is that marginal cost is equal to demand, price, but in perfect competition, marginal revenue and demand 
are the same. So what's best for society is best for the firm. We need no governments intervening in the market system. Where perfect competition prevails, the market system itself optimally allocates scarce resources. There's no industry which is perfectly competitive, but lots of industries come very close to it, agriculture being one. You've got an identical product, and in most societies, many small farms. So we can use perfect competition to make predictions about the future and to describe what is going on in many industries, including agriculture. And it's in these industries that we can use supply and demand analysis as well. To have a supply curve, you need to be able to say, when the price is this much, quantity supplied is this much. When the price is this much, quantity supplied is this much. You can do that when farms are reacting to a given price in the industry. You can't do that with monopolistic industries where firms are not price takers, they're price makers. So is it worth the trouble of learning the perfectly competitive model if we come to the conclusion that no industry in reality is actually perfectly competitive? The answer is that it certainly is worth it. There are two reasons why we really do need to study perfect competition carefully. The first is that many industries are a close enough approximation to perfect competition to be very useful for prediction. What happens when demand changes? What's going to happen when there are changes in costs in an industry? We need to be able to predict what will happen to changes in output level, in prices, in profitability and so on. And we can use our model of perfect competition in so many industries to make accurate predictions because the model is close enough to the real world to enable us to do it. But there's a second reason which is perhaps even more important than that. Perfect competition is an ideal against which we can measure what is happening in the real world. So we can look at our industry, make our predictions, understand what's going on and say, now, even if the world isn't quite like that, it's good enough to give us a first approximation. We can then drop some of the assumptions which are not realistic and see what happens when we've modified our analysis. And we'll discover in due course that there are problems with the market system, but the insights we get into those problems come because we have first of all seen how markets work under these ideal controlled conditions that we call perfect competition.